and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. One of the one of the head honchos behind behind Mythcraft, which is which managed to get funded in three hours. The one and only Nathan Hurd. How you doing today, man? Good. How are you? I am do I am doing good. Oh. It, it the I'd like to say that winter is over, but I'm in Minnesota, so that would be a lie. Likewise, we're in the spring of deception right now. Uh, well, the joke I've always made is that there's four seasons. Um, approaching winter, winter, still winter, and not winter. Nice. And I, I, know, I, know, that, I know that winter is coming became a meme after Game of Thrones, but that's not a meme, that's a fact. <laughs> <laughs> so... I'd like to open with the humble beginnings, as it were, as is tradition around here. Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and how it, what made it stick. I was somewhere between five and six years old. Um, that was around the, uh, probably probably halfway through, maybe a little further than halfway through the the span of D and D three point five. Uh, my dad had been an avid D and D player since first edition. He's one of the the OGs, um, and uh, he, uh, uh, when I was, uh, I, I think it was right around six years old. My my grandparents gave me a toy castle set, and uh, uh, my mom was, uh, um, she was a little bit worried that the. Uh, castle set particularly the knights and all of their weapons would uh, turn me from a uh, sweet winnie the pooh loving child into like a murder hobo um and uh so so my dad said okay well uh you know his grandparents gave him this toy uh, and he really likes it let's find a way to make it uh something really positive instead of something that's just like blood and guts uh, and that's where D and D came in. My dad sat me down and uh, handed me some level one character sheets, told me that I was a hero now, and then uh, walked me through uh, uh, 3.5 adventures that lasted uh, um, from the time I was six until I was probably nine or ten. And then I lost interest in it for a few years. Uh, came back for some of the fourth edition. Played through a lot of fourth edition. Didn't hate it as much as everyone else did, but looking back on it, I, I do see how it feels very different than the other editions do. Um, played the entirety of 5th edition, and now I'm doing my own thing. Mm -hmm. And for what it's worth, my the stance I've always had in the, in this temple regarding 4th um, edition is one of one of um, picking up one of picking on and making fun of some some of the some of the remarks that were made at the time, um, especially especially since the the level of difference that that gets brought up a lot. Um, I guess I guess a lot of people had conven convenient amnesia because though because I saw those exact same things in 2000 with the jump from um, AD and D Second Edition to 3.0. Gotcha. So it, it's just people resistant to change. Yeah, I I liken it to how after the Schumacher Batman movies, there was this. There was this collective hallucination that Batman was always grim, dark until Schumacher came along. Whereas anybody who's anybody who's at least read a comic in the Silver Age will tell you that's not the case. Right. Granted, the Silver Age can be described as drugs, but still. <laughs> but now, when it came when it came to Mythcraft, was it was it just some was it just a case of doing something in the in the vein of of 5e and then just house ruling it house ruling away until it became something else uh part of it was that uh i have uh, made uh, several 
I've, I've made two role-playing games in the past and a handful of board games, uh, so many of which are derivative of other games. I just think let's add, a, kind of like you said, let's add a bunch of house rules and make it something fresh. Um, and uh, some of which have been games or a role-playing game that I designed more from the ground up. Uh, Grant, one of the uh, uh, other brains behind uh, Mythcraft, has done much the same for much of his life. And uh, so we are, uh, uh, three of the four of us behind Mythcraft are part of the Homebrew Network, which is a collection of actual play podcasts. Mm-hmm. Um and we've we've done a lot of homebrewing in each of those shows because fifth edition, uh, I describe it as it does a lot of things well, but nothing excellently. Um, and so throughout each of those different shows, we've done a lot of homebrew. Grant and I have talked a lot about making our own system. And so that conversation had been going on for a long time. And then all of the OGL controversy happened and we thought, you know, it's safer for us to just go ahead and make our own game that we know we can use instead of waiting for D&D to just like have the ceiling fall in on us. So, yeah, and in the in the vein of everything is everything old is new again, that's a sentiment I've been seeing a lot. And what it kind of reminds me of is where the tabletop scene was in the late 90s. Where right. D&D had got D&D had kind of gotten long in the tooth. Plus, all plus Lorraine Williams was being Lorraine Williams because no one else wanted to. <laughs> uh, if you're not familiar, Lorraine Williams was the head of TSR at the time, and she is not well liked. Okay. Uh, and a lot, a lot of her decisions were contributing factors to why TSR went belly up. It's, it's not, it, it's not all of her fault, but a lot of it is. Gotcha. Yep. Uh, but. In the in the vein of that, you had a bunch of people uh, making moves to fill to fill in the void. So this this is where you this is where you get companies like, companies like White Wolf and and um, a bunch of others um, jump jumping into jumping into the fray. Is is Paizo from that era, or did they come a little bit later? That was a that was a little bit later. Paizo okay. was was they start they started out just doing um, three just as another third party 3.0 developer before they um, introduced Pathfinder proper. Um, okay. Because originally Rise of the Rune Lords wasn't which was their which was their debut wasn't a wasn't a Pathfinder they hadn't really built the Pathfinder rule set for it. It was using 3.0. Uh, then a few years a few years later they they kind of developed Pathfinder as a 3.75. Um, and that's around the same time the D and D switched to fourth edition, right? Give or take a few years, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. And for what is for what it's worth, the the whole notion of house ruling D and D until it becomes its own thing, you are in good company with that. Um, this it's not it's cer- it's certainly not a new, certainly not a new phenomenon. The even even back in the early days, there were instances of that. The biggest one. Um, was Rollmaster. That started out as Arms Law, which was a collection of house rules that um, Iron Crown had done for AD&D, and it kind of evolved into its own thing. Uh, so, now with with that kind of thing in with that kind of thing in mind, um, one particular thing that thing that I did find a bit interesting regarding the design especially when I looked at the at the set at the setup is first first off expand expanding the um ability scores and adding two adding two meta abilities and I'd like yep. to start with I'd like to start with those in terms of my questions first one being how luck is meant to work yeah sure so uh, all of our ability scores are on a range of negative three to plus twelve, with zero being the average person. And we don't do any like algebra to determine the modifier. Like if your if your strength is three, then it's a plus three. Okay. Um, so luck is um, similar uh, for every point that you have in luck, then you get to re-roll a d twenty, and you regain all of those at the end of a rest. So um, it could be your own d20. It could be an allies or an enemy's d20. It just lets you uh, 
sway fate a little bit. Yeah. And coordination, I know it's, I know it says about it boosting the amount of AP that you have. Is is it a case where a AP is set and coordination modifies it, or coordination determines your base AP? Um, AP is set. AP starts at three, but then coordination does modify it. So for every two points you put into coordination, you get one more action point. Yeah, and that was that's another thing that I wanted to delve into. You got you guys are utilizing an action point system, which. Honestly, is something I, w I wish I wish more games would do instead of um, action type approaches. What right. made you go with an action point approach? Was that something you had decided early on, or was it something that developed midway? Uh, it was. That was one of our core uh, developmental ideas. Was we did want to move away from action types uh, for much through the same reason you said. Uh, we love board games and video games that implement true action point systems. Uh, most role-playing games don't. They they incorporate or lean heavily on action types. So we wanted to not do that. Yeah. Oh, now for for me per, for me personally, the big re the big reason why I why I've had um, issues with the with the way a lot of games do action types is for one, when it comes to improvised actions, there's always the matter of what type is this going to fall under, and a lot of games don't really provide a guide provide a um guidepost for that but there's also the right. instant there's also the instance where there's a whole action type that just isn't going to just isn't going to fit a character's action pool or a, cer or a certain um set of circumstances like if you if you're in the middle of combat you're probably not thinking about minor actions at all so that's one avenue that's just completely useless Right, or only if you're like a very specific build, like a like a monk in fifth edition. You know, they get their extra attack from a bonus action, but it really depends on a specific build for you to get that instead of just kind of having something for everyone. Yeah, and having things only work with a specific build leans a little bit into a concept I call hand breaking. Um, hand breaking is the opposite of hand holding. It's where it's where the it's where the solution isn't something that you would come to naturally. You'd need some sort of um, foreknowledge. Admittedly, there's a lot of adventure games that are my whipping boy when it comes to this um, hand breaking thing because that's the one video game genre where this is the most notorious. Um, okay. King's Quest in particular. <laughs> I've I've yet <laughs> I know King's Quest is a classic in video game history, but there's way too much bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in ter if I had to use a more contemporary example, I'd bring up Death Mountain in Zelda 2, where unless you had Nintendo power, you were going to be lost. Right. Uh, yeah, you've got to you've got to know something about the game before you get into the game. Yeah, which that's is also, poor game design on some level. Um, that's it's a whole other, it's a whole other can of worms, but that's why I'm not a fan of designing certain classes or builds as system mastery builds. And when it comes to when it, when it comes to the basic six stats, they're they're about what they're about what I what what would be predicted. Um I do find it amusing that you ended up doing um a def a defense trait for five of them. Um which is some which is um something I do something I do remember pitching at one at one point regard regarding the whole save thing that fifth edition tries. Mm -hmm. Um, hold that thought. So what now one thing that I was curious about is what le is um whether the concept of de of um defense traits and thus. Essentially, tr essentially treating e treating five of the six ability scores as having a separate defense was th was that born of um, wanting to do wanting to do that with the um, ability saves that fifth edition has. Uh, in some respect, yes. I mean, we don't want to be a, a carbon copy of fifth edition, so in some way, this is an easy way for us to differentiate ourselves having five ability based defenses plus your standard armor uh, defense uh, because it allows us more flexibility with certain types of armor 
boosting other defenses as well. Like leather armor might boost your armor and your reflexes, for example. That's, and it harkens back to some older games as well. That is a smarter move because in a lot of ways, the, w the way armor class is, de is designed... Um, the only reason you w the only reason you would wear leather armor or light armor is because you ca is because you can't afford heavier armor. <laughs> like, right. if you've got, if if you're playing say a if you're playing say a fi a fighter, there's almost the expectation that you're going to be wearing the hev the heaviest armor. But when you look at characters that would be considered fighters in a, in a lot of popular media, there's a bit of a disconnect between the class fantasy that somebody would want to play if if somebody say is say is a fan of um of Conan and right. the and the reality and the um rule set cuz something that I've spent a lot of I spent a lot of time um arguing about is maintaining that class fantasy uh oh. Somebody, somebody who's picking a ranger is pro probably probably wants to be legless. <laughs> so, a rule said if it's going to have a ranger class should allow them to be legless. Right. Yeah. I mean, I I always think of Aragorn as more of a ranger, but in either case, neither of them would ever be seen in heavy armor. Like Aragorn at best wears medium armor. Mm -hmm. Legless is certainly like light leather armor. Yeah. And. Granted, I've I've argued in the past that one of the best representations of the ranger archetype is actually Rambo. Okay. Um, if if only because I've gotten in long debates about whether or not rangers should be casters. Um, a dear a dear friend of the show has argued that they should that they should be because of the because of the um or because of the origins. I've argued that do that doing so, um, puts them in the trap that happens with a lot of half casters. Um, all the drawbacks of both and the benefits of neither. Hmm. Yeah, I've I've gone back and forth on this a lot in my own personal philosophy. Like for a long time, I thought that they that it was cool that they had spells as well, and then I went through several years thinking that they should have no magic at all. That it should just be their their skill to know like how to use nature and how to naturally make like potions or whatever else. Uh, now I'm back into the camp of having some magic, but I'm. Uh, I'm definitely not set on that particular uh, conundrum. I think I think there's room for I think there's room for both. Um, I would I would say I would say a bigger problem is in my opinion, in my experience, um, I think things like favored enemy and favored terrain work backwards. In the in the sense that unless the unless the GM is accounting for that enemy or that terrain, that's one that's one feature that's just not going to come right. up. Right. Um, I've I've long since been in the favor of of saying, okay, here's here's a bunch of enemies. When you're targeting the, when you're targeting an enemy that fits th that fits that type, you get this specific benefit, and it's not always just a plus one to attack. Right. What I've always done in in my games is I've just homebrew ruled that if you're like in the favorite terrain is that's an easier example. If you've spent a month in a new terrain that now is also your favorite terrain. So because you're a ranger, you just learn how to be better in nature. And sometimes it takes longer because you're unfamiliar with the area, but eventually you get there. Well, the, the, other, pro the other problem that's arised is um, this, this assumption that nature has to be temperate um, British-type forests. Right. Um, which is... That's going into the whole Tolkien melting pot issue, as, I, as I've called it, which... When we cover the setting, that's that's something that I'll um I'll dive in, I'll dive into the queries of, queries about, but now as I as I understand it, the the core is still uh is still one d twenty plus modifiers. The fact that you're not using an ability score does remind me a bit of true twenty, which is an interesting beast. But yeah, uh, you, you said we're not using an ability score. Do you mean a proficiency modifier? No, I mean I mean the the way that you have the ability score and then the ability modifier. You oh, just, sure. Okay, yes. You correct. just you just have a straight you just have a straight attribute um number that right. is the modifier. And right. I I appreciate that since that since that streamlines the thing and um True 20 did a, did a similar thing. Or it just, it just it just um made the modifier the attribute in and of itself. 
Yeah. Um, now, when it comes to when it comes to criticals, um, I'm assuming that if am I correct in my assumption from what I've been seeing that it's um, max damage plus your normal damage roll in combat, and otherwise it's just a a automatic success. Uh, yep, that's correct. We we still wanted the fun of seeing a twenty and like celebrating over it. Yeah, because just doing just doing double damage. Um, that's not gonna that's not gonna have that much impact if you still roll one. <laughs> exactly. It feels so terrible to to crit and then crit fail on your damage. Um, it's it's kind of like it's kind of like how I have yet to see a single person who will unironically defend um crit confirmation from third edition. Right. It's like, yeah, I got a natural 20, but I didn't confirm. Yep. So, okay, you just do worst. max damage. Um, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a case. I think one of my best friends described it as, um, as give, as giving some, giving someone a cherry pie while kicking them in the balls. <laughs> Yeah, the cherry pie is delicious, but it doesn't. But it. But That's you know great, yeah. that doesn't register because you've just been kicked in the balls. Right. And to the now to that end, um, from what I'm from from what I'm another thing that I could that I couldn't help but no, I couldn't help but um, noticed is that you do have unless I'm mistaken you have a unified health progression. We we do so far with some or with one exception in the demo, which is that the berserker has a, a special feature that allows them a a larger health progression. Um, we're probably going to do something similar with the fighter, but uh, yeah, in general, it is it is unified. Mm -hmm. what, I, what I mean by that is there is there isn't a eight there isn't a HP at each level for every um, class. Right, right. Now, one thing I'm curious about is what it is what um, death points are. Is I because I doubt it's is it is it your equivalent to the debt to the multi saves when it comes to death in five e or is there a different spin that's that's going on with it? No, I I would describe it differently. So um I I'm really happy with the death points. I wanted some way since we've been talking Lord of the Rings a little bit. Mm -hmm. I wanted some way to. Uh, allow players that moment that Boromir gets at the end of Fellowship, uh, where he really gets to make his mark and uh, show, like, a difference. And he's not, you know, he's not bleeding out unconscious on the ground, uh, waiting 40 minutes for his turn to come around again just to roll a 20-sided die and then wait 40 more minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're down to zero health, uh, you are at risk of dying, or you begin dying. Um, if you end your turn with zero health, then you get one death point. Mm -hmm. If you take damage while you're at zero health, then you get two death points uh, cumulatively. And once you reach eight death points, then at that point you die. Mm -hmm. uh, during this whole time, you are conscious. So you can keep fighting or you can retreat and try to bandage yourself up. Uh, you can uh, really think tactically and narratively about how you want that moment to look. So with with that in with that in mind, would with the death, I suppose c comparing it to death saves was was a was a poor comparison on my part because especially since them being cumulative, it probably would be better probably would be better described as um as a wound system. Yeah, if you want to make a comparison to 5th edition, I'd almost compare it to exhaustion, except that there's not, like, ongoing consequences from the number of death points that you have. It's exhaustion, except it actually matters. Okay. Well, I mean, level 6 levels of exhaustion is death, right? Um, <laughs> like, it, it certainly matters at that point. I'm being a smartass. <laughs> uh -huh. it, that's, what, that's, what I get, that's what I get paid to be. But... Now one now um one thing that di one thing that did make me smile that you guys brought that you guys brought in is in terms of conditions is bloodied. Of course, I mean, how can we not? Uh, 
Is that that's so, that's something that I've all, that I've always felt um, could has a, has a whole lot of potential. And I'm get I'm guessing um, much like much like in 4E or the addition everybody tells me to hate, but I don't because the check didn't clear. Right. Um, is it a case where there are certain certain features on both the player and NPC side that are either active and or enhanced if you're bloodied? Yes. An easy example is another condition that you can get through a variety of methods. Uh, the condition is called Vengeful. Mm -hmm. And when you're Vengeful, you do two additional damage unless you're bloodied, and then you do four additional damage. Yeah. And there will be plenty of things like that, both in class features and in monster abilities. Mm -hmm. um, one, thing that I d one thing that I did notice is... Tactical it is tactical advantage and tactical disadvantage, which is which is just a straight modifier. I'm guessing you guys are not doing the um, advantage disadvantage setup unless it's for a specific ability. Correct. Uh, so the uh, tactical advantage is going to be one of the most often used conditions, and I'll come back to that in just a second. But as an aside, on uh, rolling two d twenty and using the higher or lower. Um, it's fun to roll 2d20 together, but uh, I'm not a huge fan of the swinginess that can result in that. Like, I have advantage and then roll a crit fail, or like a double crit fail. Mm -hmm. um, there, It does still come up, because I think that's a fun and powerful game mechanic to use more sparingly. Um, but back to tactical advantage, what's fun about it is it is cumulative. So if through some mechanism you manage to get five sources of tactical advantage then that's a plus five. Mm -hmm. um, if you also have two sources of tactical disadvantage, then it comes to a plus three. You take like the net total of all of that. Mm -hmm. So now when it comes to when it, com when it comes to equipment, um, I, do, I do find it interesting that you have both minimum strength and maximum de and maximum dexterity as well as well as um, as well as speed, as well as the as well as the usual speed penalty, I'm guessing that for have I'm guessing that for things like full plates, um, the only thing that would the main thing that would change between half and and full is a higher armor rating and the min max um, relationship, um, higher and lower respectively. Uh, correct. I I actually can't recall. It's possible that it's even more punishing on speed. It might reduce you by ten feet, but. Um, certainly, the strength and dexterity caps are are greater, and the armor class is higher. I'm I'm guessing some of the martial classes have ways of working around the, uh, that kind of thing. Yes, yeah, and there's um, generic talent, or I'm sorry, specialization talents, uh, the same as like a feat or talent in a non fifth edition set setting. You know, because the five e talents are huge, chunky paragraphs. Feats and talents in most other games are much smaller benefits. So through taking some specialization talents that are accessible to anyone, uh, they're just um, th there's no class prerequisite to taking them. Through taking a series of those, you can reduce and eliminate penalties from medium or heavy armor. It's, as an aside, when it came to feat design in 5e, I looked at that as a master class of missing the point. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the whole The whole reason feats were introduced... Aside from them being a evolution of the proficiencies that were hint that were hinted at in A D and D but kind of undercooked was to allow a way to personalize your character beyond race and class. Right. And I was of the mindset that making making him limited to every five levels and an and an alternative to ability um score progression kind of missed the point of why feats were there in the first place. Especially since um, people are going to want to personalize their characters, I've I've seen I've seen many times um, people bemoaning when that they, that they ended up that the characters that they were making were too similar, right? And of course, there's the thing of if you want the issue of if you want to customize your be more customizable, you have to start dipping into spells, which is a whole other can of worms, right? <laughs> um. And that there's only certain combinations that are blatantly better than others in the way that 5e handles feats, just because of how many features each one contains. Yeah. Though, speaking of spells, 
allow me to allow me to congratulate you on do, on doing the one on doing the one on cover on addressing the one thing that's been a whipping boy of mine for my entire life. <laughs> I do not like spell slots. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I, I have. I have a I have a long standing hatred of the Vancian model as D and D has has utilized it. Right. For now, I'm not I'm not sure if you had I'm not sure if you had the same reason, but f for me the the bulk of it was two things. One, it's a carryover from chainmail where wizards were the equivalent of artillery. Two, it only really works if you. If you um, if you go with the notion that you're doing the sword and sorcery where magic is poorly understood, which kind of leads into the issue of D and D not knowing whether to shit or get off the pot as far as what kind of fantasy it wants to be, right? But it's hard. But it's hard to really do that when ma when you can sneeze in a direction and find a magic item somewhere in some campaigns, right? Like there's there's not an, there isn't a in, there isn't an in-universe justification for the limited spells. Yeah, especially given that, like, if you, let's say you're a level 3 wizard, and you burn through all of your first level spell slots, now your only option is to be more powerful? That just doesn't narratively make sense at all. The way... Th in one of, in my early days, the way that I tr that I tried to make it make, make it make sense was... Your was um your magical focus wasn't a staff or an orb, it was a gun, a gun that was using sp special types of bullets because, well, Outlaw Star is one of my favorite anime. <laughs> that was, yeah, I right. didn't even. Have... Yeah, that is that is a good way to explain around it. It was it was admittedly an ass pull on my part because then there's the issue of, well, what what determines what what bullets you're getting? And I said, well, the agency you work for is assigning them. Yeah. Oh. Uh, is it is it a per, is it a perfect solution? No, but <laughs> but I had to I had to come up with something other otherwise it was going to bug me, um, right? Because the the reason the reason the Vancean model is there is because Gygax and Arneson were a fan of Jack Vance's Dying Earth books. The funny thing is, the Dying Earth RPG that Pelgrane came out with doesn't use it. That's like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it, the closest that it does is the is how Va is how Vance would have these ridiculous long names for spells, which um is in the Dying Earth RPG, but the actual the actual spells per day model that everyone's familiar with isn't. And even if I was to, and the reason I brought up Chainmail earlier is, Chainmail was a skirmish war game. As the, as there were a lot of as there were a lot of war games back in the back in the seventies, and D and D is the successor to Chainmail in its early days. But the, but um the way things have developed that, the reasoning for having that having that system, when people are coming in who have who probably have never touched a war game in their life doesn't hold up. Right. Of course of course the of course the other problem is that by having that by having that approach it's it's used as a way to justify how stupidly OP casters can get. Uh, I you probably remember the horror stories of um Codzilla as it was called. Uh Codzilla I can't say I do. Codzilla was it was um was made as a kind of joke to show how a cleric or a druid, which is where the cod comes from, who knows what they're I... doing, is an entire party all to themselves. Okay. Um, in fifth edition, we call it cowzilla because the same can apply to warlocks who know what they're doing. Okay. And I mean that's partially because of the summoning spells, right? To a, like to, uh, a, dru to a point. A druid can summon like eight horses that can trample their enemies, and then. They, assuming that the enemy doesn't have like the immutable uh, immutable form feature in its stat block, they can just polymorph it into a worm and walk away. It's with druids. It's more. It's more the case that the the downside of wild shape is that you're is that you're not is that you can't cast. 
Except right. there's ways around that so you can cast and be and be in a wild shape form. Yeah. Which is get, which is going to end up doing more damage than than the fighter who's supposed to be doing melee damage, who's supposed to be good at it. Right. Um it's a it's the reason I pick the reason I pick on the OP is when it comes to casters in the more, in more litigious fantasy games is the is the is the fact that they are doing the job of other people better than those better than those people. Yeah. Um. Though, before, though the approach that you the approach that you've taken is spell points, and I'm guessing this was another one of those things that you wanted to do really early on in the in the project. Yes. Uh, now. It does state in the demo that you that you have ten spe- that you have ten spell points if you're a caster. I'm guessing that that's going to be something that ex- that um you're going to be getting more of as you de- as you level up. Correct. Yeah, we uh, we didn't bother to go through the whole rules of that for the demo, but uh, if you are if you take a talent in a casting class, or if you take a talent specifically in a, a spell casting source. Uh, then you get five additional spell points when you do that. So, if you go pure caster, uh, we, I, I believe it came out to 150 spell points at level 30. And it, it's interesting. So 30 is your cap, not 20. Correct. Uh, and now I'm getting flashbacks to the hero paragon epic trinity from fourth. <laughs> from fourth, right? Yeah. Which, and I. Which I'd say the only other game that try that tried to use that three tiered tr- that there's only two other games that I've covered really that have that have dipped into that three tier trinity. Um, one of them is Thirteenth Age, which is a ve- okay. which is a very interesting beast, and the other one was Adventurer Conqueror King. Um, I'm assuming those those names are the three different tiers. Yeah. Um. Adventurer Conqueror King is lo- is loosely based on um, BX era D and D, but it places a lot more emphasis on fleshing out the end game portion, where you're supposed to be a ruler with followers, which is something that was okay. there in the early days, but um, there, but di- but didn't really do much. Whereas in in um in that se- in that setup. You're at you at higher levels. You're gonna be having a holding. You're gonna be having followers, and if you're a caster, you need you need extra people helping you with spells for the higher level stuff. Mm, okay. Um. Uh, but I'm guess I'm guessing that that there is an that there is an equivalent to meta magic, and all that that does is just increase the spell cost. Right. Yeah, equivalent to meta magic, equivalent to uh, upcasting or casting using a higher level slot. Mm. It just increases the spell the spell point cost. Would would certain spells in the full book have uh, have options to to um, overcast in that sense? I.e., um, pay a higher cost to do a be- to do a better version of it. Yes, uh, more damage, a larger area of effect, uh, maybe a further range. Uh, yeah, it depends on the spell. It depends on. Uh, talents that you take outside of the specific spell that enhance your capacity to shape spells in a particular way. So I'm guessing the meta magic equivalent would would not be about boosting the what the spell can already do, but adding some extra tricks. Uh, yeah, usually. I can I can I can certainly get that. Um, now when it comes to, now um. Shifting to equipment because this is one question I for, I forgot to ask. Um, since since it's not in the equipment list in the demo, um, how do you guys approach shields? Is it a case where it, it's a boost to armor rating, or do, or does do shields do a di- do a different thing? So there's one type of shield, and it gives you a plus two to your armor class. All right. And of course, I'm kidding. That's that's <laughs> a terrible way to design it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so we've got, uh, like, eight different kinds of shields we're working on, if I recall. Uh, I'll, I'll go through, like, three, just to give you kind of a scope of shields that we offer. And these these will be reminiscent of D&D and of homebrew D&D, like, ideas. But there will be other options as well once we finish building this out. So mm-hmm. there is your standard, like, 
um uh what is it like pentagon sh- upside down pentagon shaped shield that's like pretty typical of a knight and that um, might kite, just be a kite shield a what shield kite kite shield yes um thank you i learned a term from that uh yeah so your your kite shield is just like a standard plus two to your armor that does feel appropriate mm-hmm. um but you might have a buckler that's a plus one to your armor, but doesn't actually take up a hand. So you, you just strap it to your wrist and keep using like a, a claymore or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and then your tower shield is um, two-handed and gives you total cover directionally based on how you orient it. Mm-hmm. Uh, which does bring me to the other question, because this is something that gets brought up a lot. And in some games, I've had to ask pull a way, a way to make it work. Can you shield bash? <laughs> <laughs> um, it is built into a couple shields. There's like a spiked shield that lets you do that by default. Otherwise, you could take a specific talent to use like an improvised weapon. Um, that is up for workshopping a little bit because I do think that shield bashing was far more common historically than it is in uh, like D&D and other fantasy role-playing games. Yeah. So we're still fiddling with that a little bit. Um, the funny thing, I remember going through Fantasy Craft, which... Was the, which was my go-to instead of Pathfinder for years, um, actually had shields as a weapon type that, that just happened to give you a defense boost. Nice. So I like that. In the, and I've seen, I've, I've seen some people argue, try, try and pull realism cards when it comes to, um, when it comes to shield bashing, except that was one, except, um, that was one of the big, that was one of the big strategies in say Greek warfare. Right. Everybody's seen 300. Everybody knows what a big what. Everybody's seen those big those big ass Spartan shields and how and yeah. how that thing's a steamroller because you can either hit with you can either hit with the edge or hit with the broad end. Right. Either way, it's gonna hurt. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes to when it, com- when it comes to um, races. I know I know it's lineages in this in this one, but I just I just use race as a as a ha- as a um, habit because okay. you can't um you can it's it would be it's it's going to be difficult to have to have people catch with their opposite hand unless they're the rare unless they're the rare mutants that are ambidextrous like my co host <laughs> right <laughs> uh, but some but various games have ways on how on how race um integrates and there's there has been a problem in in some games where it doesn't play a factor into at any point except for the low levels right oh uh, like in a, a lot of cases you a lot of cases you get a you get a boost you get a boost to an ability score but that's that doesn't that doesn't really mean much once you're in the teens <laughs> right oh uh, so for 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 each of the for an individual race, what it, what is it going to mo- was it going to modify during character creation? Yeah, so uh, we don't actually have our um, our races or our lineages modifying the attributes, the eight core attributes of Mythcraft. Mm-hmm. Um, we we wanted to uh, move away from the uh, kind of cultural discourse over that um, with orcs having like a, a static minus to their intelligence and that kind of stuff um and so rather than having them affect uh, attributes at all we just give them uh, lore specific abilities at first level mm-hmm. and uh, the option from a list of uh racial abilities at first level that you can then go back and take additional abilities in at um every five levels after that level 5 10 15 20 mm-hmm. uh 25 and 30 so um, the uh, elves, for example, get a kind of like lucid dreaming, uh, dream share. Uh, I'm I, I'm assuming you're probably familiar with the Wheel of Time or have read it like eight times. Yeah, um, I've I've read it. I've I've had Stephen Long on who did who did Wheel of Time D twenty. Um, <laughs> I <laughs> I um I did an entire episode. I did an entire episode of the podcast where where a good where a good fr- good friend of the show. Um, Jeremy and I had ripped the Amazon TV show A New Asshole. Okay. So, I'm no stranger to Wheel of Time. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, 
pardon my pronunciation, but Teleron Riot, the like dream world. Mm -hmm. Um, elves have that kind of thing, like as as a base feature. Dragonfolk have fire breath as a base feature, because that's pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. Um uh halflings do have their like bravery feature at first level, because I feel like given that Lord of the Rings defined that so clearly, that's it, it's just kind of an homage to that to mm -hmm. Let them retain that feature, but, I mean, it's, it's either, but yeah, as you, it's either that or go with or go with them being kleptomaniacs, right? Yeah. Um. So between the two, uh, let's let's go with bravery by default. They can choose whether or not they take the other ones. Yeah. Um. But yeah, then again, at every at once once the first level, and then at every five level interval thereafter, you get to enhance your uh, character a little bit with racial options based on those menus, uh, which also lets you think about what you have done as a character and play into what you want to get better at based on the story you've gone on. Mm -hmm. uh, now the, a lot of the races, a lot of the races that were listed are ones are ones that I, e that um either have a visual representation or, or ones where I can put two and two together. Um, the, there, there are a couple that, there are a couple that I don't, that I don't have that for. One of them is the Ketek. Yes, uh, Ketek are cat folk, uh, humanoid, uh, humanoids with cat features. Um, I actually really enjoyed coming up with them. Um, I did not come up with a name. We have a very, uh, like I'm, I'm a, I'm a creative writer. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty good at a lot of the writing process. I'm very good at world building. I'm not very good at coming up with names on the fly. So luckily, we have a member of our team who is, mm -hmm. and she's done a lot of excellent work, especially with the lineages. Um, but the, the Ketek, what you get at level one is going back to death points. Most people die at eight death points, but the cat folk die at nine death points. All right. And the other one was the Hondu. Yes. Uh, similarly, Hondu are um, anthropomorphic uh, dog folk, humanoids with dog features. Mm -hmm. um, we have had... Uh, ongoing discussions about whether they should uh, uh, be a very short-lived lineage or if they should be much longer lived because everyone loves dogs and uh, hates seeing them die so mm -hmm. um yeah where that's that's still an ongoing discussion but we're tending toward probably living around the same length of uh having a lifespan similar to that of a human i'd i'd say using it as a baseline for for now would be would be fine um there's always the possibility of of making of making sub or variant races, uh, right. in the future. Um, when it one thing that I one thing that I do find interesting is nailing is nailing down having five different types of magic. Uh, instead instead of just instead of just putting everything in either arcane or or divine. Right. Uh as you have arcane, divine, primal, psionic, and occult, um, I'm guessing that arcane is the type of stuff that you're going to see most most wizards and sorcerers me mess around with. Divine is also just a self-explanatory. Um, that's being mess being messed around with well with well divine affiliated um, cl um, classes. Um, I'm guess I'm guessing primal is going to be for druids and po and possibly bar possibly barbarian archetypes. I remember back and forth primal was the spirit of the world that was sick of the angels that was sick of the gods and demons um f fighting fighting on the world and was like get off my fucking lawn. <laughs> mm, okay. Um, I wasn't aware of that in 4E lore, but I enjoy that. Yeah, that that was the approach that they that they took, and they ex and expanded on the primal concept with stuff like the warden and seeker. Uh, psionic, obviously, obviously that would be psychic, and I'm actually glad that psionic is is integrated in it in, in it, into the system instead of trying to half create a subsystem. Which is why Sion right shoehorn it in later. Um, which is why which is why Sion I didn't I did an episode on this in the past, but Sy but psionics have been seen as a problem archetype because it's either been too weak or too powerful, or just another form of spellcaster that isn't going to be as supported. 
Right. Um, but occult is the one that I could see going a bunch of different ways. I'm guessing a lot of that is demonology. Yeah, so occult is... Um, well, I think in order to answer occult, I'll, I'll just do a quick lore dump, uh, if that's all right. Go ahead. Um, okay, so arcane is the... Uh, it's kind of a fundamental force or an understood uh, or, or or a poorly understood uh, just accepted fact of existence kind of the same way that gravity is like it's it's hard to specifically point to it but you can point to its effects and you know that it's there mm -hmm. um because arcane is so like ancient and fundamental and integral into the existence of the world tapping into it directly could be extremely perilous for you, which is why it's typically the intellect-based um, casters that will pursue it. Um, you know, narratively, that's why wizard schools are a good thing, or why bard colleges are a great thing, is so that you can take time to um, carefully and methodically learn how to use it safely. Mm -hmm. uh, other creatures that use arcane magic directly are actually gods and deities, and so the divine source is through a surrogate accessing the arcane source. It's using magic via proxy so that you are safe and sheltered from the worst like potential effects of arcane magic. Um, the trade-off then being that if um, if your god is very like fickle or temperamental, then that might cause some issues for you. Mm -hmm. um, primal, uh, kind of, uh, it's, it's a diffuse and more safe and stable kind of child of uh, arcane energy. It's a plane of existence uh, called, or it's it's it manifests in a plane of existence called the Everwilds, which is kind of the Feywild, kind of the Shadowfell, kind of the elemental planes. It's just it's it's nature and decay and and chaos. Um, but it's contained in like a pseudo physical space. In a, in a in a plane of existence. And so accessing it, once again, is safer than just going straight to um, Arcane. Mm -hmm. Psionic um, is uh, manifesting your, your soul, building up your soul to be able to influence the world around you. Um, Jedi and uh, Jedi-like characters would be Psions. Um, yeah, psychic stuff, just like you said. Mm -hmm. And uh, Occult is similarly messing with your soul in the same way that Psionic is. But uh, the way that they do that is they, rather than just through like meditation or mental discipline, building up their the energy and the power of their soul, um, occult casters through incantation, through ritual, they will siphon and uh, steal little like fragments of uh, souls or of soul energy of um, of essence from. Uh, gods or demons as you said or old ones and uh, turn their own souls into some sort of frankensteinian contraption that allows them um various capacities mm -hmm. so with now with that in with that in mind when it comes to the um when it comes to the nine functions um, alchemy, alteration, divining, enchantment, illusion, invocation, necromancy, summoning, and warding. All of all of which I'd say are fairly self-explanatory. Is it a is it a case where, in one form or another, all not all nine of those functions are represented in, in each of them? Just some of them have more than others. Yeah, exactly. So you know, um, divine is obviously going to have divining. Mm -hmm. It's also going to have um, invocation through blasts of light or powerful healing spells um so yeah uh you can find all nine in all five sources but some will play more strongly into yeah. certain sources now since you're using a spell point system i'm curious if you're se if you're separating um spe spells within within the individual um sources by a tier system i.e at certain at certain levels it you'll get you'll get the ability to to say you can cast spells at fir at first tier, tier or second tier, or is it a case where you have different spell levels? So far, uh, we actually don't have a tier separation system. So, like at the first level of cleric, you have ten spell points. 
you could learn a spell that costs 10 spell points and just burn through all of it in a day and be done with that one spell. Um, we uh, we haven't finished writing out all of the sources yet, um, so it's uh, what, what I would like to see is some mechanical differentiation between them where there is some kind of tiering system. Like, if... Uh, Ar Arcane is a great example. Like, maybe at your first level of spellcasting in Arcane, you can't cast more than five spell points at a time without risking, like, combustion, spontaneous combustion, or something like that. So, uh, we're, we're still playing around with how that exactly looks, but what uh, what I think we'll see is something a little bit unique for each of the five sources. I can... I do have I do have my own I do have my own ideas on how th on how that could be done, but that's that that's just me. the The key thing for me is that, and I'm, I get the feeling this is something you want to avoid as well, not having every caster fe um cast the same way. Yeah, absolutely. Which has always has always been has always been an issue. Whether you whether you're ca whether you're casting as a wizard or you're ca or you're casting as a um as a cleric. You're still you you're still using you're still using a spell slot and do and doing the role, um, right? Obviously, obviously with psychics that's that's the weird ex that's the weird exception. But I've already gone over that problem. Right. Um, now, when it comes to magic items, um, one of the things I'm curious about is it is. If you get if you guys are going to be handling uh, magic item slots in a, in a similar way and whether or not um, attunement will work similarly or if you have a different approach that you're going to d handle with magic items uh, that's that's still pending play testing because we've we've done some initial magic item design but haven't actually used any of it in practice mm -hmm. uh, we right now we do plan on some sort of a attunement system Um and I remember in 4th edition, there was, like, a whole diagram of a humanoid body where you marked off what parts of your body had items on them. Mm -hmm. um, we're probably not going to go that granular, but we, we just haven't figured out exactly how we want that to look at this point. Um, something I will say about uh, magic items in conjunction with spell slots, though, or, I'm sorry, with spells and spell points, is that our high-end uh, spells that you can just cast as um through virtue of being a spellcaster are lower powered than you see in like D, D and pathfinder so you can't just through your own uh, leveling up you're never going to be able to learn like the witch spell that's just not a thing in this thank game. you i do not miss <laughs> wish <laughs> right uh but there will be magic items that supersede that and allow you to access those higher end uh, spells but what that does is it allows each uh myth crafter or each game master to decide, do I want this in my game? Or, like most people, do I not want this in my game? Mm -hmm. uh, so you can really shape the equ the equivalent of, like, level 8 and 9 D&D &D spells. You can, as a game master, you can pick which ones you want to uh, be accessible. And then they become little, like, side quests to find them and figure out how to use them. Admittedly, the, the two types of spells that that I've gone out of my way to minimize in my campaigns is stuff like wish as well as stuff like scry and teleport basically any kind of spell that would remove narrative control from the dm right yeah it's really really hard to plan around that when that's so readily available in the game the compromise i made with teleport is that you can only teleport safely between ley lines yeah you can use teleport outside of them but you but you are gambling Oh, I liken it to how I liken it to how um, I remember watching X Men Two a long time ago, and Nightcrawler had his had his hang up that he has to see where he's go where he wants to see where he's going whenever he teleports because he's afraid he'd teleport into a wall or something. Right. And it's a it's a similar kind of thing with this. You could use it to teleport some to teleport right outside the dungeon. The problem is it's um it's an inexact science. Yeah. So if you're lucky, you'll go exactly where you want. If you're not lucky, you'll go exactly where you want 500 feet in the air. Right. Yeah, yeah having like ley lines or teleportation circles, that's a good way around that. Mhm. Mm uh, 
So some, if somebody wants to do it and wants to risk being a Darwin Award, they can. They can, but if they do it <laughs> and then they end up dead, they get no sympathy from me. Right. Because I, I won't. They knew the risks. Yeah, I, I warned them. I'm pre I'm pretty sure that I'm pretty sure whenever I'm pretty sure that some there's somebody who pro they probably have that do not eat thing on the package on the silica packages you get for in a shoebox <laughs> or something because somebody was dumb enough to eat it. Right. Um, I've always wondered that. I feel like that has to be the reason. Well, the the Darwin Awards is a thing for for a reason. Um, yep. There was a re there was a recent graduate of that who. Learn the lesson of, so of sometimes it's important to listen to your spouse because he found he he found a baby hippo that was abandoned and tried and tried to ra tried to nurse it to health and raise it even though his fam his family his coworkers his parents his wife were telling him that's a bad idea. Indeed. And the hippo ate him. I shouldn't laugh, but <laughs> I'm laughing. Because yeah. he, he was <laughs> he was warned by everybody and he didn't listen. Right, right. Uh because ev everybody and anybody who's in that part of Africa will will tell you, um, hippos are the avatar of fuck around and find out. Yeah. Even though they're herbivores, they have no, they will they are not opposed to eating meat sometimes. <laughs> Especially right. Especially if anybody's in their turf, but. And when it comes to the when it comes to the design of the classes, is it a is it a case where you do where you do have you you have four classes that that you had in the core um, cleric, berserker, witch, and rogue, and you've added two more vassal and um, pugilist. Uh, can I, I interject real quick? Go ahead. Uh, so we had we had four classes, the four that you just listed, in the uh, demo for anyone to download and check out. We actually had 11 classes in the core, so now that's up to 13 with the addition of Vessel and Pugilist. All, all right. Oh. So it, did, it didn't show me it didn't show me the the full the full class list in, on either the Kickstarter or in the or in the demo, so I had to work with what I had. But, sure. Um. What what are what are the um what are the ele what are the eleven classes that were in base aside from the aside uh, from the ones that I mentioned and I'd like to kind of get a feel for their particular play style or their analogs. Yeah, let me uh, pull up the list real quick. I can stumble through it by memory, but it'll just be smoother if I have a list here in front of me. Okay, so we've got uh, berserker, cleric, oracle, mage, ranger, rogue. Tinkerer, Troubadour, Warrior, Witch, and Zealot. Mm -hmm. And then we unlocked the addition of the Vessel and Pugilist. Yeah. Um now when it comes to when it comes to that list, and if if you can if you can, could you could you type it out so I can so I can reference it with what I'm get with what I'm gonna be asking? Yes. Um just because go, going off of that, going off of that list, just from just from memory, in the next few minutes is going to be is going to be tricky. Yeah, I have a good memory on things, but I but I have my limits. But one thing that one thing that I am curious about it is is when it comes to the, when it came to the design, I am I am glad that in the demo you give um. You give what they'll get, what they can get at multiple le what multi at multiple levels. Um, is it a is it a case where how how free how freeform is it? Is it a case where there's going to be a handful of class features as the pr as the primary part, or is or um, are there going to be more are there going to be more options when it comes to um, freeform talents? Uh, yeah, let me, I'll give, um, I'll give the cleric as an example, because I've been doing some work on the cleric class earlier today. Um, at the first cleric level, and I, I'm not sure if we mentioned this yet in our interview, if you saw it in the demo, but at level one, at character level one, you're just an adventurer and you don't have a class. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so the earliest you can get a class is at level two, and you could choose to just be a classless adventurer and keep going that route. And we can come back to that mm-hmm. uh, in a minute. But let's say at level two you you become a cleric. You get uh, four key uh, like baseline cleric features at that level. Uh, you get your ability to cast divine magic. You get divine ward. You get a support ability, uh, which lets you use a. Uh, use your action points reactively on other people's turns mm-hmm. and get your divine icon which gives you something akin to like a channel divinity ability based on who your deity is or what ideals you uh you worship um and so those are like the the base cleric abilities and then going from there at let's say at levels three four and five you just continue in cleric Mm-hmm. Uh, you could pick from different like talent stacks, which are um, akin to like skill trees in a video game, but a little bit simpler, a little bit more linear with uh, cleaner uh, branches that don't cross-reference each other or anything that a computer would be better at simulating. Um, so you might you might gain an ability in like an aura stack and start working on something that. Uh, feels more like a, a fifth edition paladin, but we're uh, we're putting that in like the cleric abilities in this case. Mm-hmm. Um, you might work on uh, your support abilities and uh, building out things that you can do better on uh, other people's turns. Uh, you might get better at healing. Uh, invest in uh, talents that let you boost the amount of healing you do whenever you use like a cleric feature or a divine spell, uh, but you get to pick at each level. So every time you take, every time you level up, you get one additional attribute point to put into your strength or charisma or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you get one talent point for, for this class or for multi-classing or for taking a specialization talent, which is just your standard. Any adventurer can take this as long as they meet the prereqs. Mm -hmm. Now, and I'm, I'm guessing, I'm guessing that the prereqs aren't going to fall into the same trap that, third edition feats did where there was weight there was weight where you had to do a whole lot of pre-planning um Um, i I wouldn't say you have to i would say you can i think that it will appeal to min maxers in that sense but uh it's it's also very easy to have it be narratively driven where in uh in our last dungeon i almost died uh, because I didn't have any ability to self heal reactively. So this level I I'm going to take this this feat or this talent that uh, will allow me to unlock some way to to do that to take care of myself as well as my allies. Yeah. Um an ex- an example that I've one of the big examples that I've often used when it comes to when it comes when it comes to the, when it comes to this particular prerequisite issue is whirlwind attack back in third edition and pathfinder and pa- and pathfinder first because well here's what you here's what you needed in order to do in order to get the whirlwind attack feat um you needed a dex and intelligence score of 13 you needed combat expertise dodge mobility spring attack and a base attack bonus of 4 <laughs> all to all okay. to do a all to do a also do the equivalent of Link's spinning attack that's been in every Zelda game since two, not since right. two, since it yeah, no, adventure no, none of that, none of that. At most, it's like you've got to you've got to have this many talent points already in the cleric class or the divine magic um, source, and you need like in the in the case of divine shield two, obviously you need to have divine shield one. So is it a case where? Where classes are, a, are where classes are essentially a pool of talents, or a track of talents. Uh, yes. Or, and I'm get I'm guessing the same I'm guessing the same thing applies to um, occupations. Occupations, uh, they they don't have talent stacks in the same way. They're a little bit more role play driven. Mm-hmm. Um, I would uh, I would liken them to five E backgrounds, but they don't suck. Because <laughs> backgrounds were a nice idea, but the pro- the problem is they the problem is it's all narrative. 
Right. It's all right. Nar- it's all narrative, and unless th- unless that narrative applies in this one specific direction, it's useless. Yeah. Right. So uh, backgrounds and occupations. Uh, backgrounds allow you to take certain occupations off the bat, and then narratively, based on your adventure, you might be able to take other occupations as well. Mm-hmm. But occupations scale from a uh, a level one occupation to a level five occupation and that's not tied to your character level it's roughly roughly one level of your occupation per five or six levels of your uh character Mm -hmm. um a first level soldier might have an ability that is similar to a fifth edition background in that like if you're in a region controlled by your uh by your military organization you can find a overnight uh uh, you can find room and board at a barracks Mm -hmm. but then uh, by level five soldier you might be uh, literally a general off that same army and you can levy like i don't know cr one or two soldiers to go and fight a battle for you while you do something else um and since since the entry for for soldier level one also mentions getting skill points um one question that i had regarding the skill system you have is are are skills directly tied to specific attributes and do you, or is it a, is it a case where your skill system is a bit more free form yeah so skills um that's that's one thing i had a lot of fun uh designing uh i would say um i i mean i'm the lead game designer i do a lot of the like actual physical typing out but one of grant's brainchilds was like the the spell point system and uh one of my brainchilds or brain children was the skill system so that was um you have a you have seven skills that the myth crafter might ask for you to roll and those would be directly tied to seven of your eight attributes mm-hmm. so coordin- coordination being directly responsible for action points that's its own thing we don't have skills associated with that but strength dexterity endurance awareness and uh, intellect and charisma those are the oh and luck those are the seven skills that a uh, mythcrafter might ask for you to roll as a player mm-hmm. um but as a player you have a specialization skill or a series of specialization skills which are significantly more specific than you see in a lot of role playing games there there are some exceptions there are some really robust skill systems out there but we have uh we currently have 49 skills um, and those are not for the MythCrafter to keep track of, just because, again, I typically DM and I don't want to mess with that. Yeah. Um, so so I'll ask for one of seven, and then if you have something that's relevant, then you tell me. So let's say that um, you and uh, Andy, that I'm, I'm DMing for the, or I'm MythCrafting for the two of you, and you're running along a rooftop. So I'll ask for both of you to make a dexterity check. Um, Andy does so, and uh, you and as her dexterity, you do so, and you have the uh, balance specialized skill. Mm-hmm. So you add your dexterity and whatever number of points you have in balance. Yeah. Now, with with that in with that in mind, when it when it comes, because I th- I think the. The thing that I'm always curious about when it comes to people having skill systems is making sure making sure that it doesn't get exhaustive because that was a big problem with a lot of games in the um, 90s where they would they would try and put they would try and put every single possible activity they could as its own skill and even even third edition you had that absurdly long skill list with some skills that really should have been combined like say running and jumping being separate skills. Right. Yeah, I would say uh, I I definitely can uh, be susceptible to that at times. Um, uh, it, for example, we do have a sprinting skill versus a long distance running skill. Um, having had to do running in like PE and stuff, and seeing the difference between marathon runners and sprinters, I feel like there's a there's a realism there's a realism argument to be had there, but there's also a speed of play and uh, is this fun argument to be had so um yeah we we might be susceptible to that and we will definitely listen to like feedback from play testing if if it feels that we have too many skills mhm now 
with that in, with that in mind, getting back getting back to the skill getting back to skills proper. Um, Berserker, obviously, that's going to be the, that's going to be the equivalent of Barbarian. Um, when it comes to, but I'm get I'm guessing that because of the way um, classes are designed here, you could do you could um, take the guts route if you wanted to and and have a Berserker in um, heavier armor. There isn't the there uh, yes. isn't the ar there isn't the proficiency requirements um, approach. Right. So rather than couching like certain armor or equipment behind a proficiency, um, it's just some armor requires a certain amount of strength to use or will limit your action points if you're not strong enough. Mm -hmm. um, so the 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 mage could dress themselves in heavy armor. They're just unlikely to be effective at doing so. Yeah. Uh, but it 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 does it does look like the uh, the approach that you guys took that you guys took when it came to when it came to berserk is not ha is not necessarily having a berserker mode the way the way a lot of games do but instead um giving you a, giving you a wild giving you a wild card or a freebie ap that can only be used for attacks right which well, that 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 and um bo and boosting your boosting your health instead of the you get you can do a whole lot of attacks but then you take but then you take exhaustion for how long you're in berserker. Right. Uh, now, when it comes to cleric, clerics have had the issue of being able to do so much, uh, wielding wielding heavier armor being able to turn being able to turn monsters specifically undead because of the whole vampire hunter thing in the early days um being it being able to being able to cast spells being able to being able to to heal um i'm guessing that because of the design the cleric is a bit more focused in this instance uh, yes, and if you want to do all of those different things, there's nothing stopping you, but you're not going to be an expert at all of them, because you're going to have to dilute your talents so much over the course of a few levels that you're not going to be like, you know, if, if you do that, if you do what you described, and I stay focused on, like, healing and uh, warding, protecting my allies... Um, by the time we're level ten, we're going to look like two very different class builds. And a big problem I've always had with the way a lot of people design clerics is depending on, depending on the deity in question, it it doesn't make sense for them to be healers. But the, but in the rule set, there's st they're still going to be. Or just as an example, why why would a war god give a shit about vampires? <laughs> Right, or give a sh or give a shit about undead. Yeah. Yeah, as long as it fights. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm guessing that um the divine icon the divine icon and divine source are are um your are your equivalent to the way channel divinity is supposed to work. Yeah, divine icons are pretty similar to that. It's uh you get you get a special ability based on the god that you worship, or if you are a if you're like in a religious practice that doesn't focus on a specific god then like the ideal or the tenet that you um ascribe yourself to mm -hmm. um yeah and so each each deity or ideal or domain um will have a couple different options for your icon um and then uh there's actually like a track i'm working on where you can become uh mechanically polytheistic and use a couple different abilities from different deities mm -hmm. now when it comes to when it comes to mage um something that i did notice since in some of my some of my own research is wizards tend to be the casting class that gets picked the least often and i think it's because all the other casting classes have something that they bring to the table Whereas the wizard just has more casting. Um, and ah, I didn't realize that. Yeah, I. I would have. I would have thought wizard would be one of the more picked ones. No, the 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 most pop, the mo the one that gets picked the most is um warlock. Um, sorcerer okay. gets second place. Wizard gets third place. 
So it's still getting picked, just not as much. And right. I'm guessing that that um aside from be, aside from being able to being able to obviously cast spells, there's there's um so there's some other there's some other advantage there's some other advantages that um taking mage talents is going to is going to give. And I'm also and in the same vein, I'm also guessing that mages aren't doing the whole thing of you can cast and you can cast any arcane spell. But you're get, but um, are a bit more specialized. Yeah, uh, one of the things that we're doing for casters in general is that we are um, we're not restricting the not the spells that you can pick to like a specific class list, but it is actually going to be based on a source list. Um, and so that that does lead to some balance questions that we're hashing through right now with like half casters and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, Grant actually really was passionate about the mage and is taking uh, the first draft on designing that class. So um, this is obviously subject to me seeing what he comes up with, but I think the direction he's going is letting the mage gain like kind of a core ability to craft their own spells from scratch or from a template based on existing spells. So there, there would be there. So while other people could cast spells, they're the, they're going to be the ones who can, um, freeform it. Right. And give, given the given the source and expression setup that you have, I can see that I can see that working a lot more smoothly. Um. Oracle's Oracle on the list. I can see a tricky one because my. When I think when I think Oracle class, I don't think of Five E. I usually end up thinking of the Oracle in Pathfinder, which is one which is a hybrid class. Okay, um, I'm uh, I'm familiar with the general concept of Pathfinder. I actually have yet to play it. So, uh, what what is a an Oracle in Pathfinder? Uh, an Oracle. There are there are a handful of classes that are referred to as hybrids. These are classes that are essentially kit bashes of two of two other classes. And hang on, let me because I do I do need I need to make sure that I have I have my notes proper so that I'm I'm looking at the the one that the one that I actually need. So let's, so give me a mo give me a moment because things are moving a bit slow but the the oracle is the oracle is a divine caster but one, but one that's a bit more ritualistic okay. in a lot in a lot of instances um the big thing with them is get is getting mysteries Getting mysteries, so they. Um... Well, to put it another way, um, the cleric, it, the oracle is to the cleric what the sorcerer is to the wizard. Okay, okay, that's helpful. Yeah, they are they are spontaneous casters, but they are spontaneous casters who have a spell who have the same spell list as the cleric. Um, it's just that because they're charisma based and not wisdom based, they can they can function very well as a diplomancer. Mm -hmm. Now, what's what sort of what sort of playstyle does Mythcraft's version of the Oracle lean into? Yeah, so uh our Oracle is um uh, leans I'm I'm sure leans into the same historical source material. <laughs> historical. I didn't that was not intentional. Um some of the same source material that uh, Pathfinder does, but the uh, iteration of that is a primal kind of a kind of a druidy nature or spirituality focused caster. Shaman. A shaman, yeah, a uh, great great comparison. Um, so the uh, oracle might access the primal source of magic. Or they might access the psionic source of magic, and that's a choice you make when you become an oracle. 
Mm -hmm. Now, uh, now, um, when it comes to rangers, this is the one that's been the most cursed class in the entirety <laughs> of D and D's history. Indeed. Except for the one, except for the one edition that everyone that everyone hates, except me, except you and me, apparently. Right. Um, because Ranger's been Ranger has been attempt has been attempted to get fixed in one form or another, like three or four times over the last five years. And we can we kind of dipped into it when we when we talked about the question of whether or not Rangers should be ha should be half casters or not. But I'm guessing I'm guessing the th the theme that the Ranger class has here is doubling down on the living off the land out. Um, out in the wilderness kind of approach. Correct. And uh, th this is another one that I'm actually not doing the first draft of. Uh, Maxton is, uh, he's not one of the like uh, directors of the project, but he's a writer that's uh, doing a lot of work with us as well. And uh, he's he's actually taking that, uh, taking the first crack at that. So mm -hmm. yeah, we'll, we'll see. I What I would like to see from the Ranger is optional casting. So you can take your pick out of the two styles that we've discussed. Mm -hmm. And you know, when it comes when it comes to rogue, rogue has often been the skill monkey, but because of how skills work in this, that's not that's not something that can can e can easily be um be worked. Um What is, what kind of angle are you taking? Are you taking with the rogue? Is it obviously there's obviously sneak attack and maybe and maybe some some stuff regarding traps? But is but um where are you where are you leaning it towards? Um, at at entry level, so like at if you become a rogue at second level, you're going to get um abilities that reflect your opportunism. So yes, sneak attack, and yes, a set of a additional skill points, which isn't something that you get by default from most of the other classes. Um, skill points being baked into your background and occupation. Um, rogue gives you additional skill points. Uh, we also have the rogue uh, uh, getting a an ability at their entry level to hamstring an enemy that tries to retreat from them. Um, so that's like it's one of the classes that gets a reactive action from the get-go. Um, a lot of classes don't. And uh, it um, the hamstring doesn't do damage, but it slows the... Uh, or, or at least not at first. I'm, we're, we're working on adding in options for the hamstring to also deal damage at like third or fourth level, depending on what talents you take. Um, but it slows down your enemy, allows you to lock down specific like targets more effectively, and then pop off your sneak attack on them on the next round because they can't like get away from you. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to tankerers, um, I'm guessing that would fall into the archetype of your engineers, your inv your inventors, your alchemists, your mad scientists, sometimes all at once. <laughs> sometimes all at once, exactly, yeah. So uh, with tankerers, uh, that's another class where you don't necessarily have magic by default. You just are able to build gimmicks that do different things. Um, if you if you want the D and D style artificer that uses like clockwork to create spells, then uh, we're probably going to have a stack in uh, in the Tinkerer in order for you to do that. But certainly, uh, regardless of whether we do or not, you can just keep building out your Tinkerer gadgetry while also just taking talents that directly give you access to like the arcane source so you can ideate that idea just through building building out like half of your talent points in the class and half of your talent points in casting abilities mm -hmm. now when it comes to the troubadour um i doubt it's going to have some of, some of the trappings that the bard has ha has had to deal with namely the in namely the instrument insistence and Right, and be and being a, the problem that I've always I think the reason the bard always has the reputation it does until until the diplomancer thing became um showed up was they was they were right in the middle between three archetypes. 
in a in a game that's in a game that's built around each class having a specific role. Right. So with yeah, the... it, oh, good. Uh, in in Mythcraft, the troubadour, yes, they are not tied to an instrument. Um, by all means, play an instrument if you want to, but your troubadour might be a a poet or a tumbler, juggler, uh, a uh, uh, like a party magician, like using cards or sleight of hand uh, to put on performances. Um, in terms of their like core abilities, they play a lot with our. Uh, conditions list, so they'll apply, uh, you know, charmed or frightened or uh, shaken or demoralized. We have we have a pretty robust list of conditions that do uh, different things. So mm -hmm. through their through their music or their um, wh what whatever shape their performance takes, be it lyrical or spoken, or or just a, a physical like um, acrobatic demonstration, they apply those conditions to friends and enemies. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to when it comes to the warrior, the which obviously I I have to bring this up when it comes to fighters. One of the big selling points with the fighter is oh, you can equip any weapon, which doesn't re doesn't really have that much impact when people are going to have a certain way they equip their character and stick to it. Nobody, right. And especially since nobody wants to mess around with sheathing and unsheathing multiple weapons in combat, um, th the idea of carrying a bunch of different weapons with them is just is just not going to show up. When it comes and when it comes to the warrior, I'm I'm guessing that you're not, that um for one you're probably not doing fighting style, and you're probably the features that the warrior gets are probably going to be a bit more specific right um warrior is another uh grant draft mm -hmm. class but he and i have talked about it a lot and uh, we both think that one of the better well may maybe one of the best subclasses in fifth edition is the battle master um the uh, superiority dice the fighting styles so uh the warrior is going to see a lot of that expanded uh, it's also going to have i think warlord-esque abilities um you know calling out allies helping allies tactically reposition to more effectively make use of their own powers mm -hmm. and as, as a bit of an aside i remember how in when um D, D next was was in was um the the was still an in development thing before it became fifth edition um, mm -hmm. How annoyed I was when they t when the maneuver die system that they came up with was just hoisted onto the battle master. Because originally mm -hmm. every martial character had a had a set of maneuver dice that they would use for a maneuver list. Yeah. Um, Wait, again, which is really cool. So it's uh, sad to see that it got kind of delegated in, into just one area. One area that was trying to do both that and trying to be the warlord at the same time, and right. failed and failed at both. It ju and it just became it just became it kind of it kind of morphed back into the ma into a master swordsman or or master um master we master of weapons kind of approach. Right. Which nothing wrong nothing wrong with that, but. I think I think a lot of people wanted the warlord because it scratched an itch they didn't know they had. Yes. Uh, now, when it comes to the witch, um, is it a case where this counts as both as both witch and warlock? Uh, no. We can uh, get into warlock a little bit more. That's going to be more like the vessel. Mm -hmm. So we'll get there in a minute. Yeah. But I'm I'm guessing in that regard the witch is going to is going to be in the um more typical approach. The demo already had it with a familiar. And I'm I'm guessing that it that the witch involves a whole lot of cursing. Uh yes. So the the witch is um you can do several different things with it. You can you can build up your familiar and make that like a really key part of who you are and what you do. Uh, like you said, you can get into a lot of uh, cursing and hexing. So in that respect, it dips dips into some like five E warlock stuff. But the 
the lore idea of a warlock is going to be more akin to Vessel. Mm -hmm. uh, but on, on the Witch, uh, it's another one of those uh, classes that lets you pick your divine source when you first take a uh, level in Witch between Primal and Occult, allowing you to reflect kind of the nature-y, potion-y uh, side of uh, lore around witches or the more demonology like grimoire side of being a witch mm -hmm. now when it comes when it comes to the zealot um that one i'm having a bit of difficulty fi figuring out what it's at what its analog would be sure the the zealot is a uh, religious uh devotee um, it would be uh, similar in uh, lore to uh, a paladin, although it doesn't necessarily have to like follow a strict set of uh, tenets or it loses all of its abilities. I feel like I feel like that's a great role playing thing, but shouldn't be tied to any specific class. That's something that you should decide based on who your character is. Um, but the the zealot is going to have uh, like aegises and the ability to mark enemies or themselves or allies to uh, give them kind of buffs and debuffs in that respect. Uh, but it, it's typically going to be a pretty martial focused character, uh, probably a half caster as well. Mm -hmm. And when it comes when it comes to when it comes to the paladins requirements, I ha um, paladins have had a reputation of being a problem class because they have a rules mandated excuse to be a dick. <laughs> right. <laughs> um and I I often look at lawful that as asshole. Yeah, either lawful asshole or lawful stupid. Yeah. And personally I look at I look at a lot of that as a consequence of what happens when you take the alignment chart and try to make it a morality system which it was never built for. Right. Um cuz the whole reason law and chaos are present is it dr it has its roots in the Eternal Champion meta series by Michael Moorcock, especially Elric. And in that regard, Law and Chaos were two pantheons that represented two extremes. Neither one of them were nice. And I'd say that, right. I'd say the only I'd say the main franchise that seems to have a better grasp on Law and Chaos in that regard, oddly enough, is the mainline Shin Megami Tensei games. Because Law and Chaos is represented by the Gaia and Messiah cults. The Gaia cult is borderline anarchists. Okay. The Messiah cult are authoritarians. Right. And the best ending is the one that rejects both of them. Yeah. Yeah, funnily, uh, where my mind went, where you were talking about that, was uh, the uh, DC Comics universe. Um, and, like, the embodiment of joker and uh, authoritarian superman there there is there, there is hawk and dove who are supposed to be repre representatives of 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 the polar of the polar opposites but getting in getting into any getting into any of those characters and trying to trying to summarize the ups and downs with it is a discussion i am not drunk enough to have yep. <laughs> but and this is some, this is something that I've I've often I've often stated. I'm not I'm perfectly fine with keeping the nine alignment grid and it's an effective meme, but I think I think people need to stop using it as a morality system. If you want to right. use a morality system, then go with, go with Paragon Renegade or something. I don't care. But the but every any time you try and do, you try and make it try and make um the alignment system into um a system of morality. You end up creating you end up creating problems and you end up creating quandaries that you otherwise wouldn't have to deal with. Yeah. Uh, and I'm I'm guessing when it com I'm guessing when it comes to the paladin, they have so there's some overlap with the cleric in terms of in terms of in terms of casting and divine icon, but they they don't you but they don't get the exact same. Um, Kit when it comes to their relationship with whatever deity they they have association with. Right. So uh, many of our classes will share certain stacks, but they will also have stacks unique to them. 
Uh, so in that example, the cleric is going between the cleric and zealot. Only the cleric will have specifically divine icon abilities, mm -hmm. uh, but likely they will both have, uh, whether they're exactly the same auras or they share some auras and have some auras that are different, they'll both have like an aura stack that they can dip into. Yeah. Now I'm guessing that stacks are, are essentially these pools of themed abilities. Correct. Um, many of which are... Uh, linear progression, so Aura of Bravery 3 requires Aura Bravery 2 requires Aura Bravery 1. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to the two that you that you guys have added through um, through the ex through um, the stretch goals, you said that the vessel was some was akin to the warlock. Yeah, yeah. So an occult caster that has. Um, taken some of the essence and some of the soul of a, a tremendous like deity or planar entity and uh, grafted that onto their own soul in mm -hmm. Frankensteinian form. Um, unlike most occult casters, though, the, the, the deity or the planar being in question might be aware of and perhaps even encouraging this behavior from the vessel. Because mm -hmm. something that I've always noticed when it comes to warlocks is they're... There is tremendous role-playing potential with the lore of how warlocks are supposed to work, but a lot of that potential never fo never follows through, and they just end up being a different type of caster. Right. Oh, like let I'll use I'll use one of my favorite examples of this in say binders. The idea with binders is that is that they have linked themselves to the, to essentially dead gods. There's a lot. There's a lot of narrative potential you have in that. You have in that, but that narrative doesn't come through with their abilities. And the classical warlock is someone who's made a deal with the devil. But aside aside from maybe getting maybe getting some resistance to fire, where does that where does that play out in how they play their and how they play their character both narratively and uh, mechanically? Yeah, it's a lot easier to do that narratively than uh, mechanically, just depending on like the player. Um, well, my my character in Power Word Fail is going through that kind of arc right now, and that's just through role play rather than through like a specific mechanical. Yeah, um, I think capacity. I think what I mean by that is, in a lot of cases, the difference between um, patrons for warlocks is just getting getting certain bonus spells as the is the main difference. Right, and that, that doesn't have that doesn't have as much impact when it's one spell, when it's one or two spells out of a handful of spells you will have access to. And I'm get, I'm guessing when it comes to when it comes to the vessel, there um there are there are there 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 is an equivalent to uh, to um divine I to divine icon and the like. To right, kind of the inverse of it. To reflect, to reflect, um, to reflect their proverbial deal with the devil. Exactly. Uh, which it, which is, which is good. And I'm get, I'm one of my fate, one of my favorites, um, packs that that I would always use whenever I play warlock is blade because I felt it, I felt it was probably one of the better gishes that you could play as. Um, and I'm guess, I'm guessing that ap that approach would be. Something that you could do within Mythcraft. Uh, yeah, I think so. And uh, whether it's through specifically some kind of a demon that focuses on swordplay, or whether it's through the, um, you know, Osmodeus or whatever, um, I, I'm not supposed to say like the equivalent of specific gods at this point. That's still something we're keeping under wraps. But someone like Osmodeus, um. Take some take some stuff there, and then uh, take some stuff in the warrior class, or just in a generic like mm -hmm. uh, fighter class, like or uh, fighter skill stack. Uh, there will be plenty of ways to do that. Yeah, and as far as the as far as the pugilist goes, I could put two and two together that that's going to that's going to be that that's going to be the equivalent of monk or and or any. Any um, hand-to-hand centric um, character, which does bring does bring me to something because the 
the the common approaches when it comes to monk is obvi obviously key abilities is one of them, but also in also increased movement and being able to hold their own without wearing armor. The right. without wearing the hold their own without wearing armor is some is something I'm curious about. Is it a case where your bait where certain base defenses have a have a um have a higher baseline or get or get a bonus? Yeah, and something else that we're playing with, especially with the pugilist, um, although we'll see it in a couple of other classes as well, is the ability to replace your typical armor rating with one of your other five defenses. So in the pugilist's case, it would probably be most beneficial to do that with their um, reflexes. Mm -hmm. um, although we aren't limiting the pugilist just to like your typical nimble... Uh, lightweight more dex based martial artist you could be like a boxer or kind of a wrestler somewhere in the middle mm -hmm. uh, with this class which is, which is good because um something that i've har something that i've harped on a lot of a lot of games about is, is is um not only establishing that there's more than one type of martial art but that but that people will spend time studying multiple types Right. Oh. I'm as mo as most my age are. I'm a big fan of Star Wars, and I would always bring up the forms of lightsaber combat and how that can be used to better inform someone's fighting style and as well as their character. Right. Oh. Mace Windu developing the pod and all of that. Yeah, that's that's one. The another is um Dooku using f using um Makashi ex almost exclusively. Yeah. And with and the and with a lot of with a lot of games that try and that try and have the martial artist archetype, um, it's so it's it's usually it's usually a case of we we want a Shaolin monk and all but name, <laughs> which which is where you end up having the problem of monk weapons. Which that does bring me to one other question: How are you guys gonna? How are you guys approaching um, weapon proficiency? Is it a case where you're just not you're just not using it, or is it certain ta or is it a case of you need to be you need to have certain talents in order to use we certain weapon types? Uh, so we're not using weapon proficiency. What you would need, I'll use a claymore as an example because that's a, a really easy one. Um, a claymore costs a lot more action points to swing than like a short sword. So a short sword costs two action points to swing. Mm -hmm. A claymore would cost six AP minus your strength to a minimum of two or maybe it's a minimum of three but either way uh so effectively a pugilist or a witch or a mage at level two or really anyone at level two is not going to have plus four in their strength mm -hmm. so that given that they can't get six action points at that level it makes a claim more virtually unusable by a level one character mm-hmm even if they were to play, even if they were to play defensive with it and only use it every few rounds, um, there's still a there's still a cap on how much AP you can stack. Right. And of course, the other thing I, I, I found interesting with this is that you're not is that you're not going to be able to get the high end of um, of ability scores all that easily. Right, so the b both the amount of AP that you can hold over to your next turn, and uh, the maximum that your attribute can uh, be at is half of your level rounded up, plus one. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to get to the cap of a uh, a plus twelve in an attribute until you're at level twenty one, and then levels twenty one through thirty you can have a blast with that attribute. Um, but because you get an uh, attribute point at every level, by the time you get to level 30, you could have uh, two completely maxed out attributes and a third attribute that's not far away from that. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to when it comes to developing attributes, would that just be um, taking a talent or is or are you going to be developing attributes automatically at certain levels? Uh, automatically at every level, one one point per level. Mm -hmm. And because of that, because of that limitation, you're 
it you're gonna if you hyper focus in one um, ability, you're gonna you're gonna hit the cap. Right. Yeah, you're gonna hit the cap really quickly. So it is easy to hyper focus on an archetype. For example, the like the classic berserker could just focus on strength endurance, strength endurance, back and forth every time. Mm -hmm. um, but there will be a lot of uh, obviously that that provides and opens up a lot of incentive to focus on uh, to have a couple second and or like secondary and tertiary abilities as well that you once in a while you'll throw a point toward it. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to now one th one thing I was a bit I was a bit curious about is at any point during during development had you guys considered doing the equivalent of um, hit dice. Or some, or whether hit dice or healing surges or some uh, some um, healing method in that ballpark. Uh, we are not. I tend to be a lot more uh, lethal of a game designer than uh, anyone else on the development team. So I originally had a much harsher version of uh, resting, and they uh, talked me down from that. But we we agreed that we didn't want hit dice or anything that would lead to kind of superhero syndrome in this game. Mm -hmm. And truth be told, 5th edition's hit dice was a case of missing the point of healing surges as it was. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> the whole point of the whole point of healing the whole reason healing surges became a thing was to pre was so that clerics didn't feel they had to be the heal bot. Right. But from what I've from what I've seen, your particular brand of fantasy, even though it's even though it's listed as high fantasy with the force with the force um, Superion's um, approach that you're taking, I get the feeling you lean far more into sword and sorcery in your, in your approach. In that it's significantly more lethal than something like 5th edition. Absolutely, yeah. In, in, bo in, both, le in both lethality and in um, to, a, to a certain degree in tone. Like, I'm, from right. what I'm looking at... Nah... Obvious, obviously, obviously, when it comes to the low magic end, you have that with um, pr with prehistor with the prehistoric end, but it's it's something it's something that I couldn't help but notice. the the other th The other thing was the pro was the progression of the four superians. Um, when it because the one thing that I was reminded when I saw that was um, a miniature war game pro thing called the Genesis Project where it's Yeah, I've I've heard of it, but I'm not very familiar with it. Um it was it was this three era system that that was meant to be a rule set where you could use any any kind of miniatures. Um it starts out in fa in fantasy, then moves into modern, then moves into futurist. Um Okay. You have those three eras with with um wine from from EN, but um, they're but they're not but they're not connected. They're not even there's not even a setting for the, for those, and they're designed not to have one. Um, I'm get I'm guessing, I'm guessing within those within those set within those particular settings, there's a there's a bit of notation as far as what as far as what classes and the like would be, um, bad ideas to take to take within them. Right. Um. I mean, officially, since magic hasn't been discovered yet, you know, roughly half the classes are kind of off the table for the ancient prehistoric campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, now, MCs, Game Masters, they can be creative and um, still allow certain classes, but remove specific stacks from that class, which opens up um, a lot of customization to your particular table and what you want out of the game. Mm -hmm. um, a cleric might not be able to cast spells, but still gets to use their auras, which are not related to spells, um, or their healing through short rests and whatever else they can do. So um, that can, uh, you know, you, you could say that an aura is not magical, but it's just like the inspiration radiating from that person, uh, however you want to, to justify that. Because mm -hmm. I think the bull... With with the four settings as as you have it set up here, 
the one th the one that is interesting as far as how that how that would be implemented within this um, system is sci-fi. Right. So sci-fi, we're we're not officially publishing it until we hit the stretch goal. Mm -hmm. Um, if if we don't on this Kickstarter, I'm sure we will. Uh, sometime in the future, because we're all huge sci-fi fans um, in, in the design team. Yeah. But in addition to sci-fi, just opening up more class options as well, it um, really, as you as you progress from ancient to typical sword and sorcery high fantasy, from that into post-apocalyptic, and from post-apocalyptic into sci-fi, you basically, by default, just get more and more options uh, chronologically because more things have been discovered, more techniques have been developed. And uh, in the case of sci-fi uh, and post-apocalyptic, more lineages and more racial options are discovered. Mm -hmm. And the of course of course I can see why that might why that might take a bit because the pr the problem the problem with tackling fa the problem with tackling fantasy or tackling science fiction is needing to nail down exactly what type you're do you're doing. Right. I've always I've always criticized people who who say that you can run any kind of fantasy with D and D, because if I'm if I'm running if I'm if I want to run a campaign that's set in say a um India inspired fantasy setting, well, how are you, how are you going to how are you going to handle the fact that the that um for the warrior archetype, the the sword and board setup is not is not the one that has the biggest cultural footprint um, in a lot of in, in a lot of Indian mythos. It's things like spears and especially bows. Or as well as another example, because I'm a big fan of Legend of the Five Rings, is take going with that sword and board thing. How are you going to handle that in a culture that doesn't use shields? <laughs> right. Uh, or ha or has or has the uh, mage equivalent not falling into the archetype of the wizard stuck up in his tower? Yeah, there's a ton of of reimagining that you'd have to do just to use that. At which point, just find another system, right? There's so many systems out there. Yeah, I I know some people will say house rule it, but my philosophy is house ruling is a spice, not the main dish. Right. And I don't know about you, I. I, I like it. You wouldn't. You wouldn't take a whole. You wouldn't take a whole can of black pepper and put and put it on and put it on your steak. I wouldn't. And same same principle here. Um, I'm guessing that some that when it comes to when it comes to some of the quests that you have planned, you that that there you guys do have some plans regarding, um. Regarding ha regarding having campaigns that go that go from first all the way to thirtieth, maybe not in maybe not in one go, but with the camp, but tackling support for the high level end of the spectrum. Uh, we do, we do. Uh, not at the outset, but again, it's unlikely. Uh, I don't know. Some people might. It's unlikely that people will play level one to thirty uh, between now and uh, this time next year. Um, so. We, I, th I think we have a little time, but we do fully intend to develop some, some full like level level sixteen to thirty adventures that really give you a lot of tools in that department. And when it comes to monsters, since you mentioned CR, um, I'm guessing that I'm guessing that that the game itself doesn't have CR per se, but it does have some sort of suggest some sort of suggested level. Uh yeah, yeah, and we're equating that roughly to like, um. A, uh, I, I'm I'm not actually sure what term is most current in our game. I'll have to check with Grant about that. But like a a CR one monster would be roughly equivalent to one uh, level one character. Which I'm a, I'm actually glad that it's that it's a one to that's a one to one comparison because a big problem I've always had with CR is that it is that it's used as it's used to compare it to a part a balanced party of four, which is garbage. Yeah, and um, all of and the be the best theory is the one that has the least assumptions. Um, you're you're no doubt familiar with Occam's Razor. Yes, and 
the only way, the only way to have that perfectly balanced setup is is if you had one is if you had one character in each of in each of the basic four. But that's way too much of an ask. Right. Especially especially once people start personalizing, which is which is why the which is why it, I I think it's I think you're on the right track with making the comparison between between on a one to one basis instead instead of comparing it to a party of four. Especially yeah, go oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say it makes the math a lot easier, I think, and but uh, a lot more accurate from my experience in similar games. I'd say it I'd say it also I'd say it also works in the sense that you're not going to have to deal with the issue of of um ha of having having um inter of intersecting monsters cuz no nobody's going to use just one mo unless it's a beebeg or a campaign boss nobody's going to use just one monster right even even then a lot of times like i find that the beebegs do much better and are much more likely to survive when they are not alone, just because of action economy. Mm -hmm. Um, and because of the, with that in mind, I'm get I'm guessing that there's not going to be an equivalent of legendary actions or layer actions or that or that or that kind of gimmickry. Uh, it's it's possible that there will be. I do actually really enjoy those from Fifth Edition, mm -hmm. but um. What, uh, what, what, what we've done so far is we have uh, constructed NPCs, imagined what kind of abilities they would have and how much AP that would cost for a hero of an equivalent level, and then uh, used that to write up kind of a template of uh, options that they get on each of their turns. So we're not asking game masters to track AP for, you know, six or eight different monsters at once. We've done that work kind of on the design end to uh, simulate uh, how much they would be able to do if they were a player character. Mm -hmm. Now, with with that in, with that in mind, um, putting as, putting aside these stretch goals, what were, what would you guys be shooting for as far as a page count? Um, for the uh, for the three core rule books. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that the uh, player's handbook we're looking at, I'd say three hundred to three hundred and fifty pages. Uh, creature compendium probably about the same, probably around three hundred pages. And uh, the uh, Myth Crafters guide is probably going to be a little bit smaller. I don't want it to just be a magic item codex like it is in Fifth Edition, mm -hmm. um, but it's probably going to be two hundred and fifty pages, a little bit on the shorter end out of the three. All right, I, I can, I can cert, I can certainly get behind that, and w and I do want to wish you guys the be the best of luck in the in the coming days as you as you see this this particular project through, and to make Thank sure you. that I don't jinx it. It's not exactly wood, but it'll do. Oh, um, it will. <laughs> But thank thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness at play here. Uh, thank you, Mildred. This was a fantastic temple. Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!